I love to scream. I like fighting with friends and I enjoy being scared also. I came here this weekend to feel my flesh crawl and to get goosebumps and to feel my hair stand on end. I'm just a gore freak. I write the books, I see the movies, I know the people, you gotta be here. This is where it's happening. This is Fangoria in 3D. Plata, man. The more horrible, the better. Oh, I'm in the fantasy here in the bloody guts. <laughs> Mom hates him. She thinks I'm sick. A lot of blood and guts and half the body, getting ripped apart and stuff like that. I like that kind of stuff. My parents think I'm crazy. Oh, I think they're kind of gross. Because <laughs> I think some movies have tasteless blood and guts. That's it. That's what this convention is all about. And the other ones where you see girls getting hacked up in bed, those are okay. Blood, guts, seared flesh, open wounds, chop chop, slice and dice, all of it. Garden shears, big ones, sharp ones, long ones. It's, it's fun. It's fun to be scared silly. It's great. Uh, ice picks, razor blades. I want to get into special effects uh, chainsaws, of course. That's 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 classical. That's the uh, Shakespeare of, uh, of, of horror movies. Good evening and welcome to episode number five of Constriction Pictures. As always, I'm your host, Bob. Make sure you check us out on YouTube search Constriction Pictures, um, and now we are also on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Constriction Pictures. Uh, right now, uh, we have three followers, so thank you to uh, the, the three of you out there who uh, have been listening. Appreciate it. Um, also, make sure you check out the blog version of uh, Constriction Pictures at constrictionpictures.blogspot.com. Um, again, the blog version is the sort of uh, the demo of uh, of doing the podcast version. Um, hasn't been updated in a while. Um, at some point, maybe I'll do something on there again. Um, but also, too, make sure you email us um, here at Constriction Pictures, uh, constrictionpictures at yahoo.com. Uh, that's to, you know, let us know what you think of the show. Um, if there's a particular film you want to talk about, um, you know, drop me a line and, you know, We'll see if we can meet up and figure something out, and uh, you know we'll go from there. Um, currently on the YouTube channel, uh, we have 13 subscribers. So again, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll just keep going. 13 is the lucky number, right? This is going to be the tipping point, <laughs> maybe. Um, before we get into tonight's episode, I just got to go through some quick news items. Um, I'm not sure if you heard. I think it was probably before we recorded the last episode. Um, but uh, Fangoria Magazine is back from the dead. Uh, the mag has, uh, has been purchased. It was reported um, in the, uh, the beginning of February uh, that the magazine was purchased by Dallas-based company Cinestate. Um, Phil Noble Jr. of Birth Movies Death uh, is now the, uh, the editor-in-chief. And there are plans for a quarterly print-based publication of the magazine. Um, again, the magazine really hasn't been in print uh, since issue number 344, which um, I think that was probably back in like 2015, maybe the some point in 2016, uh, they tried to do sort of a digital version of the magazine uh, with PDF versions of the, of, of it, um, which uh, you know I have a couple of those myself, but I gotta say, there's nothing like holding an actual Fangoria magazine in one's hands. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, basically they're also planning on branching the franchise into films, podcasts, and novels. Uh, the first new issue is actually expected sometime before Halloween 2008, or I'm sorry, <laughs> 2018. It is 2018. Um, but yeah, so um, welcome back, Fangoria. I love it. Um, and that actually brings us into uh, tonight's film, which is uh, the 1986 documentary from Starlog, um, Fangoria's Weekend of the Horrors. Now, uh, just a little bit of background about this particular documentary. First off, you can check it out on YouTube. It's on VHS. It came out, um, it was released by Midi, uh, Media Home Entertainment um, in 1986. And it's definitely on YouTube all over the place. Or if you go to conventions, you can find you know DVDs of it. Um, but it's definitely worth checking out if you haven't already seen it. Um, it's it's you know especially all the conventions that I've gone to, you know over the years. It's interesting to see how innocent and, and you know that 
the convention scene was um, back in the day. Um, now, one of the things that I'm still, you know, I was trying to find some information about this online, and I couldn't really find much. Um, but I'm not sure if this is actually a documentary on the very first Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors convention. Um, I know Creation Entertainment was involved, you know, from the very beginning. And uh, Creation had done um, Star Law conventions and stuff, and in obviously Star Trek conventions too. Um, but I'm not sure if if this was a, an in, indeed the very very first Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors. Um, everything was filmed um, in 1985 in Los Angeles at the Ambassador Hotel, um, which, as far as I can tell, all sources point to yes, it was the very first one. But if I'm wrong, please let me know. Comments on the YouTube page, on SoundCloud, shoot me an email, whatever. Just uh, set me straight. Appreciate it. Um, so the the first thing I guess we should talk about when it comes to this particular documentary is the artwork. Um, the cover art for it um, has sort of the you know Los Angeles skyline with you know the spotlights popping up like it's a big you know hooray for Hollywood kind of thing. It's got the Fangoria Weekend of Horrors logo plastered across the front, which you know. That was the logo that they used pretty much forever. Um, but obviously at the time that I found it, uh, it what jumped off the cover art to me was the fact that Freddy was on it. Uh, of course. Um, but you've got uh, Freddy, you've got the the Sandy monster from uh, from House, which was something that really terrified me as a, as a kid. Uh, you've got the, the troll, the titular, titular troll, if you will, from John Beekler's Troll movie. And then you have, I'm guessing it's supposed to be Elvira. It sure looks like Elvira. Her hair is not quite as high as Elvira, but she's got sort of the um, the Vault of Horror amicus vampire fangs. So maybe Elvira was a bit copyrighted. I don't know. Um, but yeah, anyway, you've also got, um, you've got quite a, an array of celebrities that pop up in this documentary. Um, we have Forrest J. Ackerman, Rick Baker, John Carl Beekler, not just John Beekler, uh, Wes Craven, Elvira, Robert England, Albert Glasser, Alex Gordon, Clue Gulliger, Toby Hooper, William Catt, Dick Miller, Steve Miner, Dan O'Bannon, and Craig Reardon. Now, especially at the age that I discovered all this, you know, the, this particular film documentary, this was the first time that I'd seen a lot of these people or heard a lot of these people's names. So as I was watching it and sort of taking notes, again, it was kind of like light bulbs were going off, you know, all my years of being a horror fan. I was like, holy shit, that's who that person was, or that was the first time I saw that person. Um, so basically what I'm going to do um, for the duration of this episode, I'm just going to sort of do a breakdown of, of the documentary as it you know, progresses. So just bear with me here. I'm going to, you know, just some little notes that I kind of made about it as it goes on. Um, something cool you can do if you want to pull it up on YouTube, you can sort of uh, listen along, I guess. Um, but everything starts off with various LA landmark postcards. You got sort of uh, women's hands with black fingernail polish, which I don't know if that's supposed to be Elvira or what. Um, looking through everything, and you got the sort of hooray for Hollywood music playing. And then the music transitions into a very ominous, you know, sort of, I don't want to say cheesy, but, you know, stock, very ominous stock sounding, you know, horror type type of music. Um, and then it starts showing fans lined up throughout the entire hotel, which I'm not sure if that was to get in or if they were just in line to see the big headliners like Rick Baker at the show. I, I don't know. It's not really clear in the, in the show. Um, and there's, you know, various uh, voiceover interviews, man-on-the-street interviews with um, some of the fans, too, as, as, you know, the camera's kind of stalking all the, the people in line. Um, and a couple of cool things that popped up are, are some of the T-shirts, and especially being a horror fan, being, you know, these days you go to conventions and you see T-shirt stands, and, I mean, some of the shirts are awesome, some of them uh, not so awesome. <laughs> but uh, for me, some of the older shirts... Um, that were around in the 80s, and, and, you know, I mean, I guess it all starts with the Dawn of the Dead t-shirt, as stark and and sort of plain as that was, and just, it, it's so definitive, you know? Um, 
there's a couple of shirts that pop up uh, on fans, a couple of Texas Chainsaw shirts that are incredible, and I wish I could find some really good photos of these shirts. But, uh, you know, it's literally just quick glances of, of people. Um, there's also uh, the original blue, the baby blue Day of the Dead t-shirt. Um, that pops up in, in one point, um, which I have one of those myself, um, although it's a, a bit small. <laughs> I can't really wear it, but it's still cool to have. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of cool fan stuff um, throughout this documentary. And one of the things that, that really leapt out at me while I was watching it was... There's a there's a lot of quote unquote normal looking people, um, you know, in attendance and in in the audience throughout the whole thing. Um, the the show really starts off with Carrie O'Quinn, who um, at the time um, was you know the head of Fangoria and all that stuff in Starlog magazine, and he has his opening statements, um, welcoming the fans to the convention, um, and you know how they're going to have a lot of fun over the next 48 hours and meet a lot of new people and you know be friends and all that fun stuff um but you know they they show a lot of people throughout you know and i'm sure there was some trickery with some of the editing and stuff that it wasn't all just for that um but some of the people they show they're just normal people you know there's not and again this isn't to say anything about um the fans today you know just because i don't have any you know tattoos or anything like that but you don't see anybody that looks like you know they could be walking in from a heavy metal show do you know what I mean? There, there's a couple of people that pop up later on in the documentary, which I'll highlight, who maybe sort of fit that bill. <laughs> um, but yeah, th- um, there's also some cool Ghostbusters cosplayers that pop up throughout uh, the documentary. And there's a lot of different cosplayers, actually. A lot of cool people with um, some cool um, costumes. They put a lot of time and effort into them. I mean, the Ghostbusters, I mean, even as a kid, when I first saw this thing and in, uh, you know, 86, 87, 88, whenever it was when I got the, the VHS, um, I always thought those guys were really cool looking, you know, they had the proton bags, they had the outfits, they had the gloves, they had the, I mean, it was, it was badass. Um, in fact, when they first show them, there, there's a cool, uh, poster that I never really knew what it was for. I knew it was Day of the Dead. It was a giant Day of the Dead logo behind them in the background, and, you know, obviously looking at it now, knowing what I know now, I'm like, oh, cool, it's the, it's a freaking poster for the soundtrack for Day of the Dead, which is pretty rad. Uh, then we move on to, um, quote-unquote, Fred Krueger, which, if you know, in uh, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, he's not really referred to as Freddy Krueger, but just Fred Krueger. Um, and they talk about a Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which, at the time, was, um, you know, um, hadn't, as far as I can tell, hadn't been released yet. So there, there's some clips from the film sh- shown in the documentary, um, and I really didn't put this together until the other night when I first sort of dove back into this documentary. But watching that, you know, watching the, the preview clips of Nightmare on Elm Street 2, I mean, the keyword is preview clips, right? So, I mean, it's literally before Nightmare 2 came out, so just Nightmare 1 had happened. So this is before Freddy exploded and the Nightmare on Elm Street phenomenon became a phenomenon, you know? Um, which is really interesting to see um, the fans, first and foremost, but also they interview Robert England and Wes Craven. And Robert England, in his interview segments, uh, you know, they're sort of peppered throughout the documentary, but especially in this particular section here, um, he's not the Robert England that everybody kind of knows and expects nowadays you know he's very um he's very laid back he's not like robert england turned up to 11 you know like he is kind of now you know where he's feeding off the 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 persona you know where he's he even mentions you know about how um as an actor you know he's like i'll play a lawyer tomorrow if you ask me (laughs) you know um but it's it's really cool to see that that sort of pre not necessarily pre-fame but pre-freddy fame you know that was going on at the time and even Wes craven when he pops up i mean that was probably the first time that i had seen Wes craven and um knew who Wes craven was you know um and i think his interview um portions in, in, in the documentary just solidified my thoughts on, on the type of person that he appeared to be. And of course, in every other interview that I ever saw of him, he always came off as 
you know, a very reserved, very, um, very smart, very intelligent sort of guy who may as well have been a college professor, which obviously, you know, we know his background pre-filmmaking, um, but he always reminded me of some of my favorite teachers in high school and college, um, you know, so, um, and, and again, too, the fact that, you know, Wes has, you know, unfortunately passed away, like a, a few other people that pop up in this documentary, um, you know, it's also just kind of a bummer to see him and kind of stings a bit that, you know, we'll never get to see him again. Uh, but there's also some cool um, shots of, of Wes and Robert doing some signings for fans. And I mean, the lines are huge. They're signing. And I don't know if Wes was signing these, but they had the, this cool Nightmare on Elm Street 2 poster, sort of promo poster that I remember having, too, where Freddy's, you know, there and he's got his glove sort of over his face. Um, but Robert's furiously signing those. And there's people are throwing Fangoria number 50 at him. He's signing those. It looks like Wes is signing those, and people are just, you know, really stoked. And there's also a female Freddy, or f- I'm sorry, female Fred Krueger cosplayer, um, who uh, is showing off her homemade Fred Krueger claw and her mask, and you know, that she made her makeup mask, which is really cool. And again, you know what I was saying about how it's pre Freddy <laughs> explosion. Um, she's got you know the Nightmare One sweater without the stripes on the sleeve on the sleeves so seeing that again and i never really put two and two together i was like well duh it's because you know nightmare 2 hadn't come out yet (laughs) and so she was going off from nightmare 1 but you know awesome stuff um and then there's a montage there's there's quite a few montages in between some of the segments uh, mostly of displays and some of the stuff in the dealer's room some of the fans they show fans kind of checking stuff out looking at toys looking at magazines um which you know incidentally too i wonder what some of the prices were on some of these these items back then um whereas some of that stuff was you know only maybe a year or two old maybe five years top some of the stuff that they were showing um especially even the fangoria magazines but on the fir- first montage, um, we see um, there's the, uh, the uh, a mask, a whole collection of masks that somebody made, and there's um, a fluffy mask from Creepshow, um, and also the Creepshow graphic novel. And I remember seeing that as a kid, and, and Creepshow was one of those films that really struck me as a kid, which it may have even been the first horror film I ever saw. But um, I remember definitely being a little freaked out by that just seeing the creep show artwork i was like oh shit you know um and then of course even though he's not listed in the uh, the starring credits at the beginning of the documentary tom savini he pops up and um he's got um he pops up at, at one point a little bit i'm getting ahead of myself now okay so i'm gonna slow down but tom savini does pop up anyway Um, His Lizzie creature from uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the episode that he directed, the first episode he directed in the closet, Um, the Lizzie creature shows up. Um, And then Craig Reardon, um, who he's he's doing a makeup demonstration on um, on Tony Lawrence, who uh, was a writer for People magazine. And I tried to do a quick Google search to try to track down maybe Tony had done an article about his experience at the show. Fortunately, I couldn't find anything, but um, if uh, any of you out there know, um, you know, maybe that'll help solidify whether or not this was the very first um, Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors convention. I'd love to know. Um, but uh, one of the cool things that Craig is doing is he's doing a makeup demonstration, and it almost looks like he's literally out in the hallway, <laughs> which is kind of weird where, you know, nowadays doing makeup effects demos on stage, you know, there's always a huge crowd for those. Um but he's sitting there, you know, talking about his experiences of getting into the genre, being bowled over, as he says, by, you know, monster pictures and horror pictures um, and getting into makeup effects business. And um, so he's kind of turning Tony Lawrence into a, a creature right there, you know, almost sort of a sort of some sort of zombie creature. You know, he's putting makeup on him. He's not really he doesn't have any as he says, he doesn't have any pre-made prosthetics or anything like that with him. Um, but then again, this sort of transitions there's a lot of people that they interview who are into splatter effects you know splatter was the big thing in in the 80s um and uh they're talking about how they're really interested in the special effects side of it and maybe networking and meeting people and you get the feeling that some of these people actually are effects artists themselves 
Um, but then it transitions into Rick Baker, um, and there's some Rick Baker talk, and um, from what I can get and the way that people talk about him in the documentary, he's sort of the rock star headliner of the show. Um, I mean, aside from Robert England and Wes Craven, obviously. But, I mean, at this point, he had been, he had already won the Oscar for American Werewolf in London, so it was definitely kind of a big deal, as they say. Um, and they show Rick, and he's, I'm not really sure where he's at. He, it, it looks like he might be, like, in the bar. It's kind of an empty room, you know, he's just kind of by himself, and he's sitting at a table talking about, um, Greystoke, and, he, and he's got the white eyes head um, from Greystoke, and he's kind of showing off the the uh, the prosthetic and everything, and how it's starting to crack. And you know, this is 1985, so I mean, his stuff was al- already starting to unfortunately fall apart. Which he even says that's the one downside to being in that business is that you know, his his uh, creations only have a limited time, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but there's also a cool photo of, of Rick Baker um, with various masks that he did for the different stages of decay from Incredible Melting Man. And as a kid, I never knew what that was. I hadn't seen that. I mean, I had seen, you know, uh, um, one photo from The Incredible Melting Man and, and, and a Fangoria magazine that I had as a kid. But seeing it there, I was like, holy shit, what is that? You know, he's surrounded by these corpse-looking masks and there's these decapitated head things that are around him too and it's and of course this was a cover of Starlog magazine that I literally just discovered and I don't know I know it's kind of embarrassing that I'm just now discovering that it was that you know that that's what that is but um it's a really cool uh image and I'm sure if you've seen the documentary you know the one I'm talking about because it's a badass photo of him uh then there's a a mon- another montage of the fans, and this is where we get Tom Savini. Um, so this would have been probably the first time that I saw Tom Savini, um, unless you know, like I said, I think Creepshow was the first horror film I saw. Um, so obviously his cameo as the garbage man, one of the garbage men at the end of, of the film. But um, I remember seeing him in the documentary, and you know, I had been aware of the artwork for the uh, Scream Greats Volume 1 video, which also was put out by Starlog Video um, around the same time, 1986. Um, so I knew, I kind of put two and two together, that, well, that, it's that guy with the nose and the mustache. I know him, you know. And, of course, he's doing what he was sort of known for doing at conventions um, back in the day where he's got a little baby Leah, and he's ho- balancing her in one hand, um, which is always kind of funny. Uh, and then um, Walter Koenig from um, Star Trek pops up, um, him and his son Josh, which obviously Josh went on to play Boner <laughs> on Growing Pains, and unfortunately, you know, he passed away a few years ago um, as well. But it's cool to see them because they just pop up. Um, you know, they're just checking out the dealer's room as fans. I mean, Walter's not even there from what it looks like signing. He's just there hanging out. Name drops Rick Baker and, and Bob Burns. Um, which is cool, and they're, you know, looking at stuff and talking about checking out some of the films that are going to be shown at the at the convention. Um, so that stuff's cool. And, and this too, you know, talking about that with the films that are being shown, and I'm wondering if at that point, if they weren't just showing previews of some of these upcoming films, or if they were actually showing these upcoming films. Like, uh, for instance, they interviewed John Beekler in the next segment, and he starts talking about how he had just finished, um, he just got back from Rome, where he was directing his debut feature, Troll, um, and I'm not sure if that's a Q&A after a screening, or if they showed a few clips, like, you know, from the Fangoria shows that I had been to, where they would show a few clips, and then, you know, talk about it, um, but the interesting thing is that the clip they show, um, is from, uh, from the scene in the film where, um, I, to be honest with you, I've only, I've probably only ever seen anything from Troll, not Troll 2, but the original Troll, from this documentary, talking about this particular scene. Maybe I caught part of it on TV, you know, once as a kid, but um, they have Sonny Bono in it, um, and I remember Sonny in the in the film being sort of like a neighbor or a landlord or something, and being sort of an asshole to the little girl, and um, in the clip, you know, he's, the little girl's kind of hiding in his apartment, and he's chasing her, and he goes to catch her, and she's the troll, and he goes, holy shit, you know, in that kind of Sonny Bono voice, and that always stuck out to me, 
But of course, the troll pricks him with a ring, and you know, and he starts convulsing and pulsating, oozing green bile kind of shit. And um, then he turns into a freaking pod of some sort and busts open with vines that almost look like pot leaves, which I don't know if that's intentional. <laughs> but um, you know, he kind of does his thing, and and so. Th- to me, that's the only clip that I've ever seen of Troll. Um, I just, for whatever reason, I just never invested the time to watch the whole movie. <laughs> but, you know, right there. Uh, then they talk to Joel Shepard. Um, we, we, we all know uh, Joel Shepard from Return to the Living Dead. She played Casey. Um, and, of course, she's talking about Return to the Living Dead and, uh, and Dan O'Bannon being, you know, the best director that she's ever worked with. Um and again, at this point, this was probably the first time I had ever heard of Return of the Living Dead outside of, um, you know, as a, as a kid again, going to visit my older cousin who uh, had a poster for Return of the Living Dead in his bedroom. And I was terrified by that freaking poster with the, you know, the zombies around the, the headstone, which obviously is shown uh, a little bit later when they're talking to Dan O'Bannon. But seeing Joel Shepard talk about it and then, you know, talking about Dan O'Bannon in this particular segment, Return of the Living Dead sort of had a this aura about it um, because I hadn't seen it yet and I remember seeing the video and, and, you know, in the video stores and um, in my hometown we had the um, uh, the pharmacy rented videos and I remember looking at all those horror tapes that they had there and seeing that artwork and being terrified by that artwork and looking at the back cover and you know there wasn't you know obviously a lot of photos on the back cover but I was definitely terrified of what was up with this movie this looks scary as shit you know um and when they interviewed Dan O'Bannon you know he's sort of I mean it's typical Dan O'Bannon um you know he's very dry but he's also again like Wes Craven very intelligent um which and this is something else that I noticed too with um with him and then later on when they talked to Toby Hooper it's like these guys at the time, the, the 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 directors of that era, were you know how Sam Raimi always wears um, a suit and tie, you know he's dressed to the to the hilt. Um, these guys carried themselves very professionally, and they almost seemed like um, you know they like they dressed like the man. You know what I mean? Like they they're they're not one of us, quote unquote. Um, where they're not like a t-shirt and, and jeans kind of guy or t-shirt and shorts kind of guy. Um, not saying that modern horror filmmakers now, you know, are like that, but, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine ever seeing Wes Craven or Dan O'Bannon wearing, you know, just a t-shirt at a, at a convention. Do you know what I mean? Uh, then there's another montage um, of the dealer's room, and there's tons of Fangoria magazines, which, you know, I mean... The generation before me had famous monsters of Filmland, and my generation, Fangoria. I mean, that's what it was all about. And um, actually, the whole spur of doing this episode, I started to go through my Fangorias and started to sort of index which issues I have and which issues I don't have. And between my my collection and my wife's collection, we're we're pretty set up. You know, we got some good stuff. Um, but you know, there's some holes that we need to fill obviously um but i mean man there's some cool covers i mean there's there's one shot where there's a kid holding up issue number eight which has uh lucio fulci zombie on the cover that's a classic um piece um they don't show it in there but um obviously the issue right after that number nine which had uh, the motel hell cover that's sort of the uh the first creme de la creme holy grail issue that aside from number one that people were tracking down and um you know, there's just a, such a great cover with uh, with the Farmer Vincent with the pig head and the freaking chainsaw. It's awesome. Uh, you know, then there's also a little blurb with um, Forrest Ackerman. They're celebrating his birthday on stage with a cake and everything, and everybody's singing happy birthday to him. And then they interview him. And again, this was the first time I had seen Forrest Ackerman and knew about Famous Monsters of Filmland. Um and, you know, they're showing some shots of the Acker Mansion, and, I mean, this stuff is just sick. I mean, it's like home video footage of, you know, I'm sure one or two of the 18 rooms that he had in that mansion with just, that are just filled with magazines and posters and lobby cards and props. And, I mean, 
incredible stuff. And I, oh man, I, I wish I could take a peek at some of that stuff one day. <laughs> um, and then the next segment was actually one of my fav- favorite segments. Um, even back then, they talked to um, a uh, makeup effects artist by the name of Jenny Aspinall, obviously uh, Jennifer Aspinall, um, as she goes by. Um, she's done tons of stuff, a lot of TV stuff, a few movies here and there. Um, she mentions uh, she just did a film called Street Trash, <laughs> which, again, Street Trash hadn't come out yet, you know, which is kind of mind-boggling to think about. Um Lately, you know, she's done stuff on, on Westworld, HBO's Westworld, and um, about a year or two ago, I remember watching Face Off on Sci-Fi Network with, uh, with my wife, we're sitting there watching it, and she was one of the guest judges. I was like, well, holy shit, it's Jenny Aspinall from Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors, right there, you know? And she still looks the same. I mean, obviously, uh, in this thing in 1985, <laughs> she looks like, you know, 1985, you know? Uh, but it's cool, and she then she says, you know, my first film that I did effects on was The Toxic Avenger, and this is, like I said, this was a cool part of the doc where they cut to the Toxic Avenger trailer. It's sort of an abridged version of the trailer. Um, I think some of the more intense moments have been trimmed out of it for whatever reason, um, but man, I remember seeing that. That was, again, the first time that I had ever seen anything about The Toxic Avenger, and just being blown away by the uh, the sheer not necessarily the, the the violence or not just the violence but some of the ridiculous stuff going on and not really you know seeing it out of context not really having any idea what the stuff was um but that that was always definitely um a high point of this documentary was the toxic avenger trailer it just you randomly stuck in the middle of this film uh let's see then there's another montage of fans and there's um you know, going back to some of the merch that pops up, there's um, the uh, the classic yellow um, Day of the Dead promo buttons with the blue logo that pop up on a couple of people, which that's always cool to see. And then, of course, there's this guy wearing the gray um, Day of the Dead t-shirt where Bub is saluting. It's just close-up of Bub's face. And, man, I remember thinking that com- that shirt was awesome back in the day. And, of course good luck finding one, you know, but I, man, I wish somebody would reprint that because it's such a beautiful shirt, so badass. Um, then there's also a dude with, um, an airbrushed, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street sort of baseball ringer t-shirt, and he's got this custom Freddy figure in his hand, and he has, he's wearing a Freddy glove as well, which, again, this is 1985, and somebody was making Freddy gloves back then, you know, and it looks just like it's I mean, it looks like it came right out of Nightmare on Elm Street. It's freaking incredible. And he's got this Freddy figure in his hand. And, you know, that's not a close-up. But I remember as a kid, for sure, looking at that and be like, whoa, what is that? Where did he get that? You know, not having any idea of, um, you know, custom toys and stuff. So that was definitely a high point for me. Um, then the next segment, they uh, introduce Elvira. And there's this fan who... Um, describes Elvira as she's bigger than life, which Elvira definitely is bigger than life. Um, she comes out, the crowd goes nuts, and um, she's taking a few questions, and they say, what What was your favorite film? Uh, or no, what was the worst film you ever shot on Movie Macabre? And uh, she says, hands down, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. And again, here's another part where um, the first time I ever heard of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and it was one of these things that I'm like, I need to see this movie. This sounds incredible. If Elvira hated it, I'm probably going to love it. And of course, you know, talking to my parents, my parents knew all this stuff. They were into that stuff. Um, So they would, you know, kind of uh, uh, liven up the the chase to find this movie by telling me stories about, oh, I saw that at the drive-in or, you know, whatever. And be like, this movie sounds incredible. I need to find this movie, you know. Uh, then they, then they go to um, auction where they they you know, one of the standouts of the uh, Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors conventions was always the auctions. I never par- partook in any uh, in any of the auctions because when I was going to them, I was a lot younger and didn't really have a lot of money. So, you know, 
because I was a student, you know, and, and I had a limited budget that my parents would give me to buy stuff. So I figured I'm not even going to get my hopes up and try to see what they have in the auctions. Um, but there's some cool items that pop up that they show throughout the, the auction bit. Uh, the first of which is, um, I'm guessing it's a Japanese program uh, for the making of Godzilla 1985. And uh, the uh, auctioneer says it's a $19 item. And um, it's sold for $5 to um, a metal dude dude is straight up he looks like demon in uh, friday the 13th part five <laughs> i mean he's got the full leather outfit he's got fringe on the pants on the freaking jacket he's got the kind of permed soul glow perm kind of poofy hair um he gets up there and he gets his making of godzilla 1985 japanese program for five dollars which who knows how much that thing commands today uh then there's sort of it there's it intercuts with an interview with um adam malin from creation on the start of their shows and getting hooked up with fangoria magazine and um you know that's sort of like i said it kind of goes back and forth between that and the auction um and then they cut to um uh, uh the guy the auctioneer saying england has sir Lawrence olivier america has arnold schwarzenegger and he's got this giant commando poster and obviously at that point I knew who Commando was because I had seen the movie I had the action figure that came out <laughs> so um, seeing that poster I mean the poster might as well have been 7 feet tall but obviously it wasn't that big but you know it's still a cool poster and sold for $5 incredible right uh, then he says I hold in my hands the shooting script for a little movie I call Halloween and again probably the first time I heard of Halloween uh, he doesn't show, or they, they don't show how much it sold for, because they cut away and, so, you know, so show. Um, I think it was more of the Adam Malin interview, and then they come back to um, there's some sort of some kind of monster arm that looks like it's severed, um, that uh, sells a bit of a bidding war and it ends up selling for twenty dollars. But there's even a woman, you know, tending to a little baby in a in a stroller, and she keeps flashing her hands up to say, you know, how much she's willing to bid on this thing. Uh, I always thought that was kind of cool. That you know, here's this mom with a little baby trying to buy this hideous monster arm <laughs> that's severed. Um, but for some reason, I always thought it was the uh, the severed arm, the monster arm from from House, because right after this, they cut to um, Steve Miner talking about House, which um, incidentally hadn't come out yet. Uh, and he starts off by saying he grew up in a house that. Um, was reportedly haunted in, in Connecticut, um, which is kind of cool. And then there's some interview stuff with William Cat, um, some clips from House, um, including, uh, you know, the swordfish scene where the swordfish on the wall is going freaking bonkers and he's beating the shit out of it with a, a trophy before blasting it with a shotgun, um, with the old double barrel. And then um, probably the scene that scared the piss out of me as a, as a small child um, he runs down the stairs and his ex or not ex-wife his estranged wife Sandy shows up and um, you know and he's kind of shocked by her being there and he has the shotgun puts it on the table and she's like what are you doing with that gun and one of the shotgun shells rolls off the table she bends down to pick it up and when she stands up she's this hideous morbidly obese demon, monster, whatever, nightmare fuel, <laughs> before the term nightmare fuel had even been invented. That was my nightmare fuel. I mean, I was terrified by that. So seeing it in this documentary scared the shit out of me all over again. Um, but it's cool. You know, they, they show William Cat again. Um, there's a couple of different interview clips with him talking about how much fun it is to do um, that type of film and how you sort of have to roll with the punches when it comes to working with effects and stuff and just, you know, be on guard and, you know, improv, which is cool. And then um, there's another brief montage of Toby Hooper uh, posters, uh, the first of which, of course, is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And again, I got to say this, you're probably tired of hearing me say this for every single one of these movies, but it's true. This was the first time I'd ever heard of anything related to the Texas Chancel Massacre. And, um, 
you know, I had no idea, but later on, Clue Gulliger even mentions Texas Chainsaw, and it just fueled this, again, there was an aura about some of these films, and this is one of them that just, I had to find this movie, you know, it seemed terrifying, but it seemed cool, and, you know, and then they show the poster for Eaten Alive, um, the poster for Funhouse, Poltergeist, Life Force, and then they show an interview with Toby Hooper, and he's got his Invaders from Mars crew jacket on, um, you know, I'm not sure if at that point he was still filming it, or he had just wrapped it, I, I don't know, um, obviously it didn't come out until 86, but, um, he's talking about making films, and, you know, whether your budget is $15 or $200, just do it, you know, and, um, you know, uh, one day when I wanted to make films back in the day, um, that was sort of, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, words of encouragement for me, but obviously I kind of didn't do that. <laughs> My life took a different path, which is cool. Then we get into the Cinemagic Short Film Awards, um, which is cool because, you know, and I, I'm wondering if how short these films were because as they are presented in the documentary, they show what I, I'm still not you know, 100% if it's just a clip that they're showing, or if that's the entire short film. Because some of these are really cool that they show. Um, the first one they show is Second Prize for 8mm. And it's a film called It's Not Just for Ice Cream Anymore. And this one, this is nothing that scared the shit out of me. And it's a, a woman in a high school hallway, black and white, you know, and I mean, it looks like it might as well be a snuff movie because it's, you know, the print is beat to shit and she's being attacked by somebody that looks like Leatherface with long hair and a po- like, you know, ponytail braids kind of things face is all messed up and he's like cutting away at her with something on her forehead and, her, and it's black and white I mean it's crazy looking and the gremlins music is playing and I mean this thing scared the hell out of me, gave me nightmares just this person's face, you know and of course at the very end what we're getting at um, they show <laughs> behind the scenes of whoever was making this the high school that it was filmed in and they're like you know many people don't know it but um blood you know um fake blood photographs is light gray in black and white films so we use hershey syrup and he's licking the hershey syrup off the knife blade which is pretty cool um then there's this guy who um shows up and and i always thought even as a little kid that this guy was a little bit of annoying (laughs) which I mean, if you guys know who he is, I apologize. No disrespect to him, but he just comes off as a bit of a tool. <laughs> um, he's uh, he's got a puppet film in in uh, the the uh, contest called Gorg's Magic Broom, and they show a little clip, and it's you know stop motion puppets, and he's talking about the mouths that each of the characters has to do different letters and stuff or sounds, and it sounds like he does all the voices too. Um, but I was like, man, this guy, what is this? You know, he ends up getting third place. And he seems kind of disappointed that he got third place. You know, threatening that, you know, next year I'll be back and I'll get first, second, and third place. And then they show a cool clip from this thing called Rick Blazon is in Trouble. Um, which, you know, um, as a kid, to me, it might as well have been a real film. But it's, you know, it's obviously an homage to the sort of serials from the 40s and 30s. Um, definitely a huge inspiration, um, or was hugely inspired by the, the Crimson Ghost serials. Um, cause the main bad guy is called the Flaming Skull and he comes out and he's got this giant skull face over a, you know, with a hood and everything very much looking like the Misfits mascot. Um, and he's got sort of a Skeletor voice, but it's a cool little, uh, little piece. But then they show, um, and then they show uh, the first prize one, which was called Welcome to the Real World, which I guess didn't look very hard to me, but, you know, it's shot in Miami Beach. The guy who won it um, said he was from Miami. And it's like a silent film. It's kind of a throwback to, you know, Charlie Chaplin stuff, you know, kind of cranked at, you know, double speed. And, you know, it's just kind of goofy. It's fun. But then they cut to uh, this other one that got second place for the 16 millimeter contest called Night Watch, which I don't know again if this is just the clip or if this is the entire film. But it's got this guy, looks like he might be a night guard or something, running through subterranean tunnel, 
and he's, you know, running, it's black and white, he's, his footsteps are echoing in this hall, and, like, maybe he's being chased by something, and he gets to the end of his door, and he's trying to open the door, and one by one, the lights at the end of the hallway start going out, as it's getting closer to him, and it's getting faster and faster, you know, like, it's catching up to him, almost like Evil Dead style, and, um, you know, and then he gets into this room at the last minute, and he's in there, and all of a sudden his keys leap out of his hand and his keys go up into the ceiling where there's a grate and he's kind of like looking up like what the hell and then before he can even finish thinking about it he himself starts floating up to the top of this grate and you know again this is a independently made little film and I don't know how they did it but dude floats up to the ceiling and he's up on this grate holding on for dear life and this weird dude shows up on the other side standing like he's above ground looking down at him and it's thunder and lightning and stuff and all of a sudden the guy kind of looks at him and then the keys fall and then the guy's like standing you know holding on to the thing and he's like ah and he ends up dropping and you know presumably dies but um that was a pretty cool thing and, and I always thought that was cool as even as a, as a small kid watching it uh then next we we see Clue Gulliger um who he's talking about the classics you know that he grew up on and how um, they're the classics today, but back in the day they were life, you know, going to see Frankenstein, The Mummy, Wolfman, Dracula, those kinds of movies. Um, and he talks about, which is interesting, um, he talks about all the modern movies at that point. So again, 1985, Reanimator, Nightmare on Elm Street, Return of the Living Dead, Whisper to a Scream, which he had shot, and that, from what I understand, didn't come out for a couple of years. Um, and he says... You know, even if they're not classics today, but 10, 15 years from now, they will be. And sure enough, I mean, 30 years later, 30, 32 years later, 33 years later, we're still talking about those films, love those films. Um, then they talk to, we, we meet um, Alex Gordon, um, producer of films like The She Creature, a lot of American international stuff, and he's sort of talking about his career and how um, he mentions how. Uh, you know, um, somebody he was dating, I can't remember if he said it was his, ended up being his wife, but he took her to see one of his films, and she kind of handed back the ring that he had given her and said, if this is the kind of film you're making, you know, <laughs> I don't think we can continue this, <laughs> which is funny. Um, and they talked to Albert Glasser, who, um, you know, he talks about scoring the classics and stuff, and Roger Corman stuff, and he mentions um, The Amazing Colossal Man, and how it you know, he did that picture and how it was playing on TV, luckily, to this day. So he's getting residuals, which is pretty cool. But he also talks about a Roger Corman picture that he did where Roger had um, called him up and said, Hey, man, I got this movie that's you know, a real stinker. The score is terrible. You know, um, would you be interested in rescoring it and saving the picture? And sure enough, they kind of haggled over it for three or four seconds with a price. And then <laughs> he did it saved the picture, made a lot of money, but he didn't say which picture it was. Kind of bummed. Um, then they talked to um, Clue, Gulliger again, or Clue Gulliger again. We cut back to him, and he's talking about Texas Chainsaw. And this is something that always stuck out to me as, um, to this day, I'm still scratching my head about it. He, um, he says, um, he's talking about Texas Chainsaw, and he refers to Leatherface as Piggy. And I don't know where that came from, you know, was there something I missed? Did I miss a memo or something about Texas Chainsaw? So, to me, that sort of fueled this speculation before I even know who Leatherface was. I always associated him as being Piggy. Don't ask me. Um, but he talks about how his adrenaline starts pumping, his heart starts thumping, and he almost has an erection. TMI, Clue. TMI. <laughs> then we have this cool uh, little fluff piece on um, Toby Hooper's Invaders from Mars remake and Toby kind of, you know, it's another brief interview with him where he's sitting on the stairs and, and somewhere in the hotel talking about remaking the picture and how he was very much a big fan of the original film and there's some you know cool shots um, from the original film and how he sort of duplicated them or paid homage to them in his film and then again another first I'm introduced to Stan Winston they show Stan Winston um, behind the scenes talking about designing the creature and how it wouldn't just be a man in a suit. You know, it was going to be this this monster. And 
again, Stan Winston, I mean, legend. I mean, I, I he's a guy who 10 years later after he passed away, you know, I'm still shocked at, at that we don't get to see anything from him anymore. Um, when he actually, when he passed away, I, I remember crying. I was really bummed out when I got the news that he had passed. Uh, then we see Dick Miller, and again, Dick Miller was a dude who I remember seeing from Gremlins as a kid, didn't know who he was, and of course, the Explorers, the Howling, um, and he's talking about his career, which at the time, it's kind of funny how um, he says, you know, he's been in the business 30 years, <laughs> 1985, so, you know, now add 32 more years to that, 33 more years to that, and um, he's still kicking, you know, but he's saying how you know, it's been a rough business to some extent, and, um, you know, for the most part, he survived, which is cool. Uh, and then they have this cool montage of of um, saying horror in one word, and you get people saying things like stimulating, disgusting. Uh, there's a dude who says blood, and he actually looks familiar. I can't place him. Um, I was looking on IMDb to try to figure it out. I think he might be an effects artist. Um, I, I just couldn't place him. I know his face. It's a, obviously a younger version of his face, but um, I've definitely seen him. Uh, you get a kid saying gory, somebody saying scary, suspense. Robert England says, John Carpenter's the thing, and he does this kind of thing impression with his hands and his tongue, and <laughs> which is cool. Um, Wes Craven says, dark. And then John Beekler says, ah! Um, Clue Gulliger says poetry if it's done well, which is cool. And um, and then Dick Miller really sums it up for me um, by saying it's fun. You know, I mean that's really all I ask for in a horror film is that it's fun. Whether or not it's good or bad, I could care less as long as it's fun. And I'll say that you know where you know the the forty seventh Friday the Thirteenth sequel that comes out, people will shit on it. I mean. And as long as I had fun, that's all I care about. Same thing with Halloween. I mean, I'll go on record as saying Halloween Resurrection, which I give um, my better half shit about <laughs> with Buster Rhymes and everything. It's still fun. So, you know, I can't hate it, of course. Um, and then everything gets tied up with uh, in a neat bow with the costume contest, which if you've ever been to a Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors, that's how they always ended. They would always do the costume contest on Sundays, and again, there's some really great costumes that people made. You know, there's a dude in a V visitor outfit. You see him throughout the documentary too. Um, but there's uh, there's a couple of cool werewolves. There's um, there's a guy who, for some reason, I always thought was supposed to be Big Ben from House. Um, you know, in my disinformed or uninformed brain, I thought he was supposed to be Big Ben, but he's like a military dude who's all chewed up zombie looking and looks really cool, really gnarly looking. Um, of course, we've got the 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 cosplayer dressed up as Freddy with her gear, and I mean, we see her through uh, before they show the actual contest, they show some of the people talking about their costumes, what they're going to do, and they show her, and she's sort of putting on her makeup and talking about it and saying how she... Um, you know, just last week, the drive-in by her house was showing a Nightmare on Elm Street, and she went in costume and was sort of creeping around the theater, and, you know, uh, people were freaking out, and she's like, you know, when you start to get reactions from people, you start to go a little crazy, which, that's something that always pops into my mind when I'm in costume on Halloween, and I start to get reactions from people, I instantly think of her saying that, and I feed off of the reactions that I get, as I'm sure anybody who puts on a costume does, um, which is cool, you know, that's just a whole lot of fun, and again, it goes back to what Dick Miller said, that it's fun, you know, um, but yeah, the, the costume contest is cool, they don't really show, you know, who won what or anything, um, there's one guy who shows up, and he actually shows up earlier in the documentary, he's a, a gentleman who, um, like a creature designer, and unfortunately, I don't know his name, but he talks about, um, this creature that he, said is going to be featured in the costume contest. His name's Creech, and he's sort of this, you know, burly-looking thing, and he's got these eyebrows that flick up and down. And the funny thing about him, and sure enough, he shows up in the in the costume contest, but my first or second Fangoria is a Weekend of Horrors convention that I went to, so it was either the first one in 95 or the second one in August of 96, he was there. And I ran up to this dude, and I was like, yo, 
Creech, and he had Creech. He had the costume there, and um, you know, I took a picture of it, or I think I took a picture with it. And I don't know if I'm sure I wasn't the only person to ever say, "Dude, I know you from the Fangoria video," <laughs> you know. But it was cool. It was like seeing a celebrity who wasn't really a celebrity, but to me, he was a celebrity, you know. But um, yeah, and that pretty much concludes the uh, the Weekend of Horrors documentary, um, which um, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Please check it out. Um, it's great fun. Um, you'll love it. Uh, it in, and again, it's especially if you go to conventions today, it's cool to look back and see how sort of innocent things were back then. You know, it wasn't such a big industry, such a big business where you know people are throwing down hard cash just to get a signature. Um, I realize that's the nature of the business, but back then that wasn't the case. Um, I guess the only thing that was missing for me in this documentary was um, Tony Timpone. I saw his name mentioned um, in the credits, which is cool, um, but it would have been cool to see him on there because to me he's always, you know, he's the editor from when I was, you know, Fango Kid. So, um, but yeah, shout out to, to Tony. But yeah, thank you for listening. Um, this has been fun, and um, unfortunately, you know, I apologize that um, I'm just running solo right now, but it was sort of an idea that I came up with at the last minute <laughs> to do. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next time. This has been uh, Constriction Pictures, and, um, yeah, later. I think when I look back on it, I enjoyed my whole life of making up stories that scared my friends. The interesting thing that's happening now, I think really uh, as a result of uh, films like Nightmare on Elm Street, is that we're getting into what I have coined as rubber reality, which is uh, films that deal with the way that reality can be distorted and permeated, uh, going into dream states, into in states of madness, and uh, this, uh, all sorts of strange illusions that uh, haven't been treated in film since Cocteau, I think. And uh, so in that sense, they're becoming less blood and guts and more uh, hallucinatory, which I think is basically what films are anyway.